this is the first time that Reeves has had a pre homecoming eve uh, panel and we're very excited to to do it you all know that this is the year of the arts and we're folding into that idea off and on throughout the year as well this will be a an informal conversation about creativity at work and each of the people on this panel is an artist in a different kind of way. I think together they're going to be really great. This will be somewhat conversational. I will start with questions and then at some point I'll leave the time for you to ask these wonderful panelists questions as well. So let me do some quick introductions. I won't spend a lot of time on that because the conversation is going to be interesting. So um, in the middle is Rodney Farron who has a lot of jobs, actually. So I'm going to just mention a few. He's partner at the Crumpton Group in DC, founding director at Disney's Global Intelligence Practice, senior analyst at the CIA, producer and consultant for, consultant for films and TV. And I won't mention all the films and TV, but there are some good things to mention here. Homeland, probably many of you watched that series. Um, Billion Dollar Spy is forthcoming. So very exciting. To my right is Brian Credatus, a professor at William & Mary, an artist. I think several of Brian's students are in the room, so yay you for being here on a 5.30. <laughs> Friendly audiences are good things. Um, Brian is a painter. Brian has expertise in printmaking, also, he has exhibited work in lots and lots of countries. Remember, this is an international panel, so I'm going to just mention some of those countries. Australia, England, China, France, Iceland, Japan, Serbia, Sweden, and the U.S. Uh, one thing I really like about Brian is anytime I've had Brian on a panel like this, which was just actually one other time, but any, <laughs> any, any time that's happened, he speaks about important things like art and the human condition, and I kind of guess that some of that may come up today as well. And then on the end is Sylvia Tandesiars. I am the colleague who knows how to pronounce her last name, and I'm very proud of that. Um, she is an author, a scholar, a poet, and a translator, uh, an expert in Latin American cultural studies, especially Argentina, but not exclusively Argentina. She's interested in memory and trauma, and often that uh, comes through the arts. Uh, her most recent work, a translation of a book of poetry called See in My Bones, won a very important uh, translation prize. I was lucky enough to be at the launch of that book in London just a couple weeks ago. Welcome to the panelists, welcome to all of you, and let's get started. Okay. So I wanna start with um, Brian. You, um, need to turn on your mic. <laughs> and I think that the really, Hello? very good. So behind um, the panel is Brian's art, especially the self-portraits. So this is pretty fascinating. And really, I'm not gonna talk too much. I'd like to have Brian explain how these self-portraits work, how they have transformed year after year, and what the story is that you're trying to tell. Uh, first, thanks for having me. It's great to be with the other panelists as well. I'm not used to the microphone, so sorry about that. Um, when I think about the self-portrait, it started out, as it does for most people, as a form of practice. How do I paint a figure? How do I paint a head? How do I paint a face? How do I paint metal? And I think that that how, particularly for students, is very important. How do I do this? How do I do that? Because if I don't understand the how, I'm not going to be as effective with the why. Why am I doing it? And I think that originally, as I said, it was practice, but over time, it started to take on another meaning. I remember that I read when I was about 25 years old that one of my favorite painters, Lauvis Kornath, a German painter, did a self-portrait every year for his birthday or somewhere around the birthday. I'm like, steal that. That's a really good idea. And so I started when I was about 25, that portrait in the 
upper left-hand corner is me, the first of this series. And so now I'm 54, so that's a lot of self-portraits in between. <laughs> One of the questions always becomes, do you do them on your birthday every year? I do not. I do them somewhere in that time. And this is a selection of those. And one of the things that I really became interested in about doing this is the way that it forms a narrative of cross time. The way, and there's two different narratives that are going on, I think. The narrative of the way that I view myself psychologically, ideas of beauty, ideas of aging, ideas of masculinity, those are all things I've been exploring while doing that. And the other one that's sort of harder to talk about, because if I could say it, I probably wouldn't paint it, is that exploration of painting or drawing or printmaking. And the way as I've aged and I've had more and more experience doing that, the way that my opinion of that has changed in different things that I might explore without it. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm just going to point out one or two quickly so we can move on. As I said, the one in the upper left-hand corner was about 25 years old. I edited out all the ones that had me with a mullet in it, so no one got to see that. I took those out. So this is only a selection of the ones. Uh, the one right next to it is the first self-portrait I did in Williamsburg. I had been living in Philadelphia in Dublin for 10 years, and then I remember we moved to Williamsburg, and it was a really different environment. And like trying to get a hold of what that environment was going to be like and what I was in that. Uh, the one next to it is my self-portrait at 40. As everyone knows, 40 is a very traumatic age for everyone. Uh, my wife bought me a birthday crown, and after a couple drinks, I decided to wear it all night and decide I should do a self-portrait as that. A uh, couple other ones, and maybe I'll skip to the last ones, and then that'll be it. The last three, uh, or actually the last five, were all during COVID, during that time. And like everyone else, I was sequestered pretty much to my house. Luckily, no one I knew got very ill. We didn't lose our jobs, all that kind of horrible thing that happened to so many people. But it was definitely a different environment and a time that became very introspective for most people. And I remember when I did that first self-portrait, the one with the West Virginia shirt on it, is that I really wanted to wring as much as I could out of looking. And I wanted you to really be aware that that was me looking in the mirror. That's why I didn't edit out the West Virginia. That's why I put it on backwards the way it would appear. Uh, the one in the landscape next to it when we started to emerge from that, and then those last two when we were sequestered again during that time when I myself caught COVID. And again, that sort of reflecting, asking yourself what your meaning is, is I think that's something that really becomes really inherent in the self-portrait, and that's something I've been exploring for some years now. Brian, are any of those in, in another country than, other than the U.S.? Uh, let's see, none of those self-portraits are, uh, another slide I have with, uh, so this is another example of me working in a narrative sense, but this time in printmaking, and just to tell you very quickly, because I don't know how much time this eat up. But yes, go ahead. Um, yeah. so again, when we got sent home during that time, uh, you know, I thought we were going to be back in about two weeks. And then after about a month and a half in, I realized I better start doing something. And so what I did was I wanted to create a series that captured that time. And I don't think of myself as an overtly topical artist, someone who's doing something right of that moment. But this was an opportunity for me to do that. And it started out simply with a couple images of my kids. Of course, you're surrounded by the people you know and you care about. And after doing a couple of my daughter and the one of my son up at the top drawing, I started to realize that maybe there was a series there. And one of the things that I decided, of course, me Zoom teaching there as well. And one of the things that I decided was that I wanted to have a specific focus. So I decided that I would pick a single day. And then I was trying to figure out, well, which day am I going to pick? And I was listening to all my 90 CDs, driving my wife crazy. And one of my favorite ones was uh, Gillian Welch's Revelator. 
and she has a song on there when she's talking about the 14th of April. Uh, the 14th of April didn't mean anything to me in particular, but it's a really famous day in US history. It's the day that Lincoln was assassinated. It's the day the Titanic hit the iceberg, and it was the day of the biggest uh, dust storm of the Dust Bowl. And so starting to think about all of these things that happened historically, and to take one day to pin it down, to give it something really specific. And it also uh, allowed me to explore my earlier love of graphic novels. Like every single kid who ends up being an artist, I loved comics. I wanted to be an illustrator. I was going to be in comics and all of that stuff. And while I've kind of drifted away from that as my main interest, it, it was a chance to revisit a little bit of that. And so I did that series. Um, and the next slide shows the ones that are international. All right. That's awesome. We'll come back to it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rodney, um, this week, I think the last time I talked to you, I learned, I had in my mind that you were mainly a consultant. And then I learned in conversation, though, well, yeah, that's true, but not just, that you also <laughs> create. So I would like uh, to get started in the conversation with you on the idea of the relationship between like going into Hollywood and as a consultant, but actually a consultant, it, what you do is much more than that. You also make something happen. You create something. So just if you could go with that idea and, sure. and, and talk to people. Sure, sure. Well, um, a lot of us former intelligence officers, I spent 15 years in CIA as an analyst, a lot of us, when we, when we leave the agency, most, mostly retirees, uh, they're very attracted to uh, the idea of helping Hollywood make film and television. And so when there's an opportunity for one of us to consult on a TV show or a film, we usually jump at it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's usually where ex-CIA officers like myself get typecast and they stay at that level. Um, and so my, uh, my, my business partner and boss, Hank Crumpton, and myself, we decided that we wanted to do more than that because we wanted to tell stories that we had in mind, right, that, that uh, were inspired by some of the experiences that we had so that we can show the American public what their spies do for them in their name, good and bad, right? Um, and so the only way to do that is if you do it yourself. And what that means is being a producer as opposed to just a consultant. So the consulting work that I do on the side is actually not paid. I, I just have a few friends in Hollywood who are writers, and they'll call me up and ask me to, to you know, look at a script or tell me how to do this, or they bring me on set and say, does this look right? And I'll do it because it's fun. Um, but, uh, but, but my main uh, interest is in writing and actually producing. Uh, the shows and, and films that uh, that we see today. So, give us a little bit more about that writing and producing the films that we see today. Like, give us some <laughs> some examples. Well, please. remember, we're doing this part time. So, <laughs> so we, well, you know, a few years ago, um, we had an opportunity to uh, put together basically a book of ideas for uh, a friend of ours who was a, a a big producer in Hollywood named Robert Simons. Um, you would know him because he did basically every family comedy in the 1990s. Anything with Steve Martin or Adam Sandler was a Bob Simons production. And he was, uh, he was in his early 30s at the time, so he was kind of a wonderkin. Anyway, uh, so fast forward to now, and he says that there's, there's some dislocation in the industry, and, there's, and television was, was becoming more popular and more interesting to the creative people in, in, in the writing room and every, writing rooms and everyone else. So he asked us, "Can you? we're interested in the spy genre, can you pr provide some ideas for us? And the first idea that we had actually ended up working, and that was uh, a show called State of Affairs, starring Katherine Heigl and um, Alfre Woodard. And it's about the, uh, uh, and Katie plays the, the president's briefer from CIA, which was a job that um, I helped uh, support and was a substitute for. I was actually a, on the president's daily briefing team, but my subject was, or my, my uh, uh, I was assigned to Director Tenet at the time. So I had the second best job in the, <laughs> in the building. Anyway, um, you know, uh, so the whole process was such that we had the idea um, and then we, we started meeting with agents to try to get 
stars interested and excited. And the first one we went to was, was Katie Heigl, who at the time was making $15 million per, per, per film. And she wanted to come back to television to try something different. And so she, uh, we, we spent a lot of time with her and her team and, uh, and, and got her really interested in this idea of a, of a character that no one's ever seen before on TV. Right? It's about the president's briefer and how much power that person actually has every morning to set the president's agenda for national security that day. Um, it's, uh, and, so, uh, and then we brought in the writers who, who then jazzed it up <laughs> and made it not only an interesting political thriller, but also something that affects, um, that deals with family, uh, that deals with a lot of the personal uh, issues that we all deal with that you never see in most spy uh, and, uh, films and, and, and television shows. So that was our first show. It was uh, NBC picked us up for uh, prime time right after The Voice, and uh, unfortunately, we only we only lasted for uh, for one season. But I'll tell you, seven million people a week they would love <laughs> they would kill for those ratings right now. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, turning to Sylvia, also sort of by way of introduction, uh, you do a lot of things, wear lots of hats, from being a vice dean in arts and sciences to a poet and a scholar and a teacher and a translator. It's the translator part that I really want to focus on right now. Sort of like the question I asked Rodney, I think that people might have the idea that a translator um, supports something, makes something available that isn't available to everybody. And that's probably true, but that's partial, right? Mm -hmm. The translator also creates. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so um, the, the translation that <laughs> just came out is See In My Bones. And um, what brought me to translation, you know, being a writer myself, having written my own poetry in Spanish and English, being bilingual, um, uh, and teaching actually a poetry writing workshop. Uh, I loved to um, work between languages. Uh, I've loved the creative process of going back and forth. Um, and I've been, I think, concerned through my entire sort of professional career in the work of storytelling and the work um, of the arts in the world um, and why we engage with the arts in the ways that we do. Um, I'm, as Teresa said in her introduction, I am very interested in human rights and in memory and in reparations and reconciliation and transitional justice. And so what, what does that have to do with a translation of a Puerto Rican poet um, who, whose work, this work in particular, um, retells a story of Puerto Rico um, from the moment um, of the indigenous Taino and their creation myths through um, the, um, the, the period of colonization, through the slave trade and the introduction of African um, you know, cultures to the island, you know, on all the way to the present and the kinds of um, journeys um, that happen across seas um, that lead to um, seas full of bones um, and the sea also in her own bones, in the poet's bones. Um, I began translating Juana's work very early on in my professional career because I heard her read her work one day and I thought, this is a voice that I wish English language speakers could have access to. I thought, you know, her audience, I mean, she's always written in Spanish, so her audience has been limited. And I thought, um, this is a great American poet and American in the sense of you know, the continent, in the sense of the Americas, in the sense of Walt Whitman and all of those um, you know, uh, uh, multitudes right, that, um, that a poet can contain. And so I thought I wanted to extend the reach of her work. 
And I had done other kinds of translation, critical translations of academic treatises, where there's a lot of poetry there too, because the particular critic I was translating would invent <laughs> lots of words and concepts, and we had to figure out like how do you get this across in a different language. Um, but it, the first time I translated poetry and tried to describe what it was like um, to my friends, colleagues, um, my kids, um, it's like plain dress up. You know, you get to inhabit this amazing wardrobe, this amazing story. Um, you try on those shoes and you sort of learn to walk in them and you turn them into yours. Um, and it's absolutely an act of creation. Uh, this um, earlier today, we um, heard John Panetta talk about the process of writing poetry. And, um, and one of the things that he said that he does in his classes is he assigns lots of times um, particular structures. Like he'll say, you know, write a villanelle or write a sonnet um, because he believes that the constraints of the form um, can, can be really great um, scaffolding um, and really great ways to um, exercise, practice creativity, um, but in a way that is um, supported or contained. And I think that the same thing applies to translation. You know, Juana's poetry is the original. There is beauty and truth and, um, you know, just... Uh, humanity, you know, in her verses, there's song, there's, you know, I, I can't do that. But what I can do is try to capture that experience using my own creative um, abilities to um, help that poetry travel, to help that poetry move. Um, and so this is one example um, of um, a poem. Um, in the depths of its waters, the dead don't speak, don't dance, don't laugh about their death, don't remember their life. On the verge of amnesia, head bursting with sunsets and baggage, they don't know who they were, and they seek in the periphery of the sea a hook, some longitude that perseveres in them. From that ridge, they observe the figurative, the estranged eye of art and the poems their Yola inspires, the ads that fail to grasp the heresy of tears, the irony their migrant and essential song divulges, incurable and Olympic. The night stretches between their sea moistened lips, their dreams resting in pale algae, as pale are their bones. Imprisoned in a sea camp, their coffin is a Yola pushed still by the feared echo of another time. Arbeit macht frei. Work will set you free. Thanks, Sylvia. All right, I think now I'd like to turn to asking sort of broad questions to all three. The first one's a bit abstract, so I hope we can make sense of it. One of the, my favorite sort of scholarly books is by a woman whose name is Dora Summer. She teaches at Harvard. She wrote a book called The Work of Art in the World, which I guess what I would translate to sort of like the purpose and reason for art in the world. And I don't want to say more about that. I just want to pose that concept and see what you three think about the idea that art has a purpose in the world and what that purpose might be, and what it looks like, and how it moves, all of that. <laughs> okay, now I really do stop. <laughs> I can start, um, okay. because it's one of my favorite books, too, um, and because I think that it relates to everything that we've been talking about. Uh, I understand the work of art in the world as um, the work that art does in the world. Um, so, like, how art is capable of moving us from one place to a different place. Um, in the area of transitional justice, you know, the work of art in the world can look like a memorial or a commemorative statue. And walking by you know, a commemorative statue, if I walk by 
um, the presidential palace in Chile. And what I see is a statue, a bust of Allende. Um, and I make that walk every day. I am reminded every day of Allende and what that story meant to Chile. Um, the work of art in the world can also be a way of creating pockets that invite us to lean in um, closer and to think about our shared humanity. Um, art creates the possibility of intimacy and it creates the possibility of caring. And if we care, it's much more difficult um, to um, throw grenades at one another. So um, I think it's absolutely vital. I think also that storytelling is something that touches all of us. So I was thinking about those daily briefings, right? Um, you're telling a story, and the story you tell matters, and it's going to have actual consequences, right? Um, and so that's also another way of thinking about the work of art in the world. Brian, Brian or Rodney, anything on this idea? Well, at the, uh, at, at the risk of never follow a poet on a panel <laughs> discussion because it's not going to sound as good. <laughs> but uh, I, I think for, for me, uh, looking at film and television as art, I mean, it's entertainment, sure. And is it art? Usually, I don't know. It, it, that's, that's in the eye of the beholder. But the way that I look at film and television, I've always looked at it, um, particularly because I was a, a fan of foreign, um, foreign media, was that uh, these shows, these projects, uh, can, are a form of communication uh, if you're willing to listen. And that communication is, what does a, a country's uh, art tell you about how they think, how they are, how they're organized, and how things have changed over time? So you know the whole idea of method acting, right? Where you have these actors that go into character and then they don't leave that until, the, the, until they're finished filming. A show. And it becomes, can be very extreme, right? You know, some, some people who are playing a deaf character will, will try not to hear anything. Um, in my case, as a CIA analyst, I was a, I was a method analyst. And so when I was writing about China, um, and this was in the early to mid 90s, I would watch Chinese film to try to understand better and put myself in those places. Now, what's interesting about Chinese film of the 80s and 90s, Zhang Yimou and others, is that they were also a form of, of, of free expression but disguised, uh, as allegor disguised allegory to criticize the party and show how things are, are bad but without offending them. Um, and you fast forward 30 years later and you look at Chinese film today and it's very nationalistic it's very rah-rah, um, and, uh, and that also reflects the, the mood of the country. And so these are kinds of things that, that I think um, uh, are, relates to how we, how we live our lives. When I think about art, and I think about people who make it, and I think about people who view it, the thing that comes across most to me is it's really, it's an act of empathy. You know, just thinking earlier today, uh, I was teaching life drawing, all my life drawing students back here, and constantly in class we're talking about form. How does one shape relate to another? How do you put down value? How do you put down the picture plane? And all that stuff, of course, is really important. But at the same time, you're looking at another figure, and that can't help but seep into it. And you can't help but think about what their humanity is like while you're drawing them. It's not the same as drawing a bottle, right? I mean, I could say it is, but that's, that's simply not true. And everything that you think about the figure, whether you intend it to or even whether you like it to or not, is going to show up in that drawing. And I think, you know, that's for the creator, the person who's making that, and then when you come to view someone else's drawing or painting or film or read someone else's uh, work, you have to see the world through their eyes. It has to give you pause and make you think about what makes everyone universal, what everyone's humanity is about. And I think, for me, that's always really the importance of, of why people make and view art. 
Was there, I hope we recorded that. That was we did record it. All right, <laughs> they're really good. Um, really good to hear you speak philosophically about this question. Um, I think a complementary question that's less philosophical but also really important has to do with the business of art and the market. Um, we may return maybe to all all of the sides in in addressing this question. Uh, you published somewhere with a reason. Uh, Rodney, your work shows up in certain channels and not others, certain film companies and not others. You send prints around the world for a reason, um, and all of that does have something to do with markets. So let's. Um, why don't we go back to starting again with you, Brian, and address that. These three works right here are in international shows right now. One's in Serbia, one's in China, and one's in Portugal. And print has often been described, and I think accurately, as the most democratic form of art because it's a multiple. You know, it's very difficult to, to buy a singular painting or a singular sculpture because that's it. The fact that the print can be a multiple makes it much more democratic. The fact that at least in theory, everyone can own one, which was a big part of the attraction for me in printmaking originally. And because they are mobile, there is a whole network throughout the world of this idea of international exhibitions for prints. And typically, we send them away. Uh, a juried exhibition for those, sometimes I'm invited to the shows, sometimes they're juried. Maybe it's the equivalent of uh, like a, a juried essay for someone who would write a more typical sort of research thing. And you want to be seen in the context of what other people in the world are doing for all those things that I said a moment ago about how these are being viewed how you're viewing someone's work who's from Serbia, uh, from Portugal, and how my work is looking in that context. Rodney or Sylvia? Yeah, let me uh, just jump in with a, a bit of a story. So after we came out with our first idea, um, Hank and I looked at each other and said that, well, oh, that wasn't too hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, we came out with a second idea, and guess what? It's really hard. <laughs> Uh, and what was interesting is that when we were pitching State of Affairs, uh, we went to HBO, we went to NBC, ABC, CBS, TNT, uh, Fox, all sorts of places, right? And they were all interested in it. Now, this was 2014, 2015. Fast forward a year, just a year, right? And we had this great idea, I thought a great idea, about a, a female CIA psychiatrist who um, who is who is in the field and gets wrapped into some international intrigue in Latin America? And Michelle Rodriguez was attached and was going to be very. We loved we loved showing strong female characters and for it to be Latin America, which is different than all the terrorism I you know shows that you see out there. We thought this was going to be a winner. Well, it became harder because the markets uh, for our work had changed. So where we went to Fox again. They said that, well, we're looking now for a very, there's so much saturation in the market that they're looking for very specific niches in order to dominate that particular segment of the market. So Fox is looking for spy shows with strong male characters, okay? Um, Apple already had a show with a female character. They didn't want to do it. Netflix said, well, we already have a Latin America show, so we're not looking for one of those anymore. Uh, it, was, it was strange to see how rapid it's changed, and it still is changing, you know. So um, the, the, for us, since we do this part-time almost as a hobby, um, it's not our day jobs, uh, we have the luxury of actually being able to pick the places where we want to pitch, and if, if, they, if they don't like it, then that's fine. You know, and we just move on and, and keep doing what we're doing. So Sylvia, your recent book, the one that has the translation prize, uh, well, first I should tell the audience that professors, when we write books, uh, because of the way the university publishing market is, sometimes they sell for like $80, so no one can buy them. But uh, university, they sell at university libraries and then they're done. But that's not the case with your recent book. It's people, normal people, can, can go into a bookstore and buy this book. Um, it's accessible. How did that happen? <laughs> okay, so... Um yeah, my first, my, my, my monograph, my book on um, memory, citizens of memory, um, with Bucknell University Press, sells for like 
I don't know, $130 or something and or more. I can't even remember. Like, who's going to buy a book that costs that much money? It's ridiculous. Libraries, right? Um, it wasn't something that I was aware of when I was, you know, shipping, you know, just trying to, you know, figure out who was going to publish this. Um, so, yeah, really unfortunate <laughs> that the academic book market sometimes means that normal people can't, really purchase books, and that's really for libraries. Um, this came about um, through a Decolonizing the Humanities project here at William & Mary, um, when a colleague of mine, Stephen Shihai, invited um, me and Juanita to read um, as part of a panel and one of the people who um, was there was a publisher, the publisher of the 87 Press, who um, liked what he heard and invited um, me to submit the work to the 87 Press. And initially, I said to him, well, let me see, because really, I want this in English, and they're in the UK. Um, but I really want it for a U.S. audience because I, so I want it here, right? I don't want it, you know, in, you know, I don't want it to go overseas and not reach, you know, the audience here. Um, and so I, I identified a press, Curbstone, that had a long history of bringing Latin American authors from the South into English in the North and had been absorbed by Northwestern University Press. And I contacted them. Um, they were in Chicago. Juanita had done a bunch of her work in Chicago. There was a festival that she created in Chicago. I thought, great fit. They didn't think it was such a great fit. <laughs> so I was rejected, right? Um, and so then the 87 Press and working with Azad Sharma was amazing. Um, I think it's been the best publishing experience I've ever had, now from an article to a monograph, because of the attention and the intention with which they select um, and, and amplify the works that they've, you know, chosen to publish. And so, you know, there was a launch uh, a couple of weeks ago in the UK at a cafe. Um, we're getting ready to do an interview um, as, you know, following up from the launch. Uh, all of it orchestrated, like this prize, I mean, I had no idea. All of it orchestrated by the press, which to me says, you know, there's, there's intentionality about the work that the press is doing in order to magnify certain kinds of stories in the world. And to me, that's really, really important. I'm going to ask one more question and then uh, give the mic to the audience. So lots of students in the room, um, creative students, smart students, who might want to do some creative work after graduation or before graduation. You, you know, can you just become a creative, artistic, functioning person with a salary um, by, uh, as, as you move into the world of the arts. What, what do all of you think about that? You're probably good. <laughs> uh, I guess I was just thinking about the way, to, the way to go about it is just be bold. You know, like, that, like the example I gave at the very beginning where CIA retirees want to break into Hollywood, they get typecast and into, as being consultants, never get into producing or writing or anything like that. Uh, it was only because Hank and I were brave and stupid enough to take an idea to somebody and say that we want to push this, that it, it actually worked. We could have talked ourselves out of it, but, we, you know, say that we couldn't do it, but we just created a strategy. Right? You look at your allies. Uh, it's just like an, an intelligence operation, human operation. Who are your allies that can help you, get, uh, help you achieve the objective that you've set out for yourself? And then work it that way. But, uh, but be bold and don't be afraid to, to experiment. Sylvia and Brian, do you think there are ways to use your artistic um, abilities in jobs that aren't obviously about the arts? I mean, Sylvia, you're a vice dean. 
right? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, uh, loaded question, right? I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, of course, the arts. There's no better training, I think, for leadership than the arts. I really think that creative um, visioning, collaboration, experimentation, risking, failure, practice, the practice that comes of doing it every day. I mean, all of those things are absolutely essential to succeeding in anything that you want to do. Um, but your initial question was, you know, what's, what's the advice to young people? And I would actually say, find time to devote to what you love, no matter what you're doing every day. So like, just find time for it, find pockets. Um, you might not be able to support yourself from your art from day one, but can you find ways to be, have it be part of your life um, you know, from day one and incorporate it in as many ways as possible? And what I would say is that there's no shame in having a job that pays you money. Um, I mean, right? Um, you know, even if that job is like the most tedious, you know, whatever, if it allows you to actually, you know, have your studio and do the thing that, you know, that, that you find is your calling or that brings you joy, um, to me, it's my mental health. Um, I can't imagine a life where I didn't have my, you know, time to be, to just be doing um, whatever it is that, you know, that artistic engagement um, is about, to just, you know, be in it. Um, and I think that, that it, it's, it translates into every sphere of our, you know, existence. So... You know, if there are any parents here who are discouraging their kids from, you know, the, art, the arts as a, as a field, I mean, I just can't think of a better um, way to um, engage with learning. On this, Brian, I'll give you the last word before the audience has questions. Um, so it's, the question is kind of about, it basically turns to creativity and work, right? What are your thoughts? creativity and work and how to keep that going, maybe? Or? Yeah, that, I mean, also, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's very difficult. I think it's very difficult to keep that going and to pick up on something that Sylvia said is to take your desire to do that seriously and carve out time for that. And, you know, when I went to undergraduate, it was a very different school. It was an art school and they brought us in a room and told us, look at the person next to you in five years, they're not gonna be doing it. Look at the person next to you, 10 years, you know, this sort of. And I think a big part of that reason for that is not working and taking yourself seriously and giving yourself that time. Even if it's only two hours every Saturday morning or every Thursday night and keeping that like a job because you don't know when the things are going to happen, but if you're not in the studio, they certainly won't. And you want to keep that. And I think that when you're out of school, that's something that's really hard to do. And if you can, find an artistic community as quickly as you can. Other people who are interested in it, other people who take that seriously, because you need that encouragement. You need that to keep going. And that's something that I would encourage for people who are interested in any form of art. Thanks to all of you. You've been great. And I don't know what our time is right now, but I think we have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. I'm going to give my mic to Tyler. Should we save some time? Just repeat the question for the camera. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody would, anybody would like to ask a question? have them say it and then just repeat it so we don't have to wait to pass it. Oh, I see. Yeah, you just ask it, ask it from, the, from there and I will repeat your question so it's recorded. Yes. Um, thank you so much for being here. This is really wonderful. Um, I was just hearing you all talk about like, kind of the power of our I was really struck by those answers in particular and how that kind of is linked to storytelling. Um, in a time when 
there is so much death and destruction in the world, um, and you know, colonization is still ripping through the fabric of society everywhere. Palestinians are being murdered by hundreds and thousands every day. Um, how do how do we take these horrible truths of the past and present um, and turn them into generative ways to tell stories and give platforms to people that are being marginalized to share their stories? How do we do that in like a generative and productive way that's like making space for this art and for these stories? Like, how do we do that? So to repeat the question briefly, I'll, I, yeah, that was a great question. I'll just try to synthesize it. How do we take moments of crisis and pain, destruction in the world and histories of destruction and turn the story into something that's useful and productive? I think I basically got that, right? Yeah. Okay, good. It's a really hard question. Um, and I think that I don't think there's any single answer, but I'm going to try to um, answer it in the way that I think about it. And that is, I think that we, if we could all um, take a deep breath and learn to listen to each other's stories. Um, in a conflict like the one that we have right now, uh, that um, as you said, you know, has taken so many lives. Um, there are different stories from different perspectives that are worth hearing. And story exchanges, we've had them here at William and Mary, um, can help understanding what the other side's story is, is so crucial to trying to find a way to imagine a common story in the future. Um, but if we can't take a step back and, and, and recognize that there are valid stories, right? That there are legitimate, um, important stories from varying perspectives, if we can't create the space to hear each other, to learn from each other, to then start, you know, to recognize each other's humanity, right? To then start working together to find common ground, a common dream, a common horizon, right? I think um, it's very, very difficult to get out of that cycle of violence. Um, and so, to me, if we think about the work of art in the world, the work of storytelling in the world, the stories we tell matter. How we tell the story matters. Who has the power to tell the story matters, right? Um, and who we give the power to, right, um, amplify the stories matter. Um, I don't know if that helps. But I do think that it's super, super important. And it goes back to, I think, what both you know, Brian and Rodney were saying. Um, these various forms of art are ways of creating pockets of intimacy. They're ways of creating um, uh, caring, inciting caring, um, and ways of revealing the humanity um, that we share and um, understanding each other in deeper ways. And so um, I think that art has a really important role to play in getting us to that other place, to that horizon that you're dreaming about. Thanks for that question and, and the answer. Mike. Um, I, I actually have this question uh, looking at, at Brian's um, self-portraits, and I think it now kind of applies to everyone. So um, is it I, I understand the importance, the crucial importance of empathy um, when you're dealing with art. Uh, but I was looking at your self-portraits and I thought, you know, is it different for you when you are creating a piece of art that is self-reflective um, and is autobiographical um, than when you're doing something that is not? Um, and 
you know, are you know, does does it does it change the way you look at your at, at your creation and your story? So, Brian, I'm going to repeat the question first. So, the um, question is about empathy and what happens when the work of art is autobiographical. How how do things change? I think I think for me, when you're when I'm working with myself as a model, I can be a lot more truthful than when I'm working with someone else. Um, both mechanically and the fact that I have more time, I can spend as long as I want. And I am not afraid of hurting anyone's feelings. I remember when I was an undergrad, uh, I went home and I was drawing this picture of my grandmother and thinking about this sort of way that I have of looking that can be viewed as kind of harsh and thinking that I got to stop this drawing because she's not going to like it. And I wasn't willing to do that. And so I stopped that, but with yourself, I, I can do anything I want to me and it won't bother me. Could we see those self-portraits just one more time? <laughs> I should have kept the mullet ones. Notice, Notice how handsomer he gets as the time <laughs> progresses. <laughs> if there's another question, I think we'd be happy to take it and then we'll have a reception, enjoy some, some food and drinks together. Anybody else want to ask something? Mike. Uh, I'll ask a question of Rodney. Um, two, questions, two questions, actually. Uh, I got the impression when you were comparing uh, Chinese film in the 80s and 90s to Chinese film today that the, your, your explanation for why the art was so different, nationalist now and subtly critical then, had to do with the mood of the country then and now. And I wonder if it is just the mood of the country that's different, or um, is the process of making art, are the Chinese authorities involved in a way that would screen out uh, subtle criticism? Second question. Uh, Let me repeat the first one before I forget it, okay? <laughs> so um, the question is about China, the making of art, uh, nationalism, and screen the possibility of screening out types of art. Second question has to do with your, I took it your partner in crime, and when you guys were producing these films and these, these shows together, was he also a former CIA operative? Hey, Grunted. Yeah. Grunted. Yeah, he's, a, he's a, actually a CIA legend. <laughs> so then this question is ideal. Are there, were there times when you all were sitting down together behind closed doors where you're like, I've got a great idea. We got to do this thing. You remember that time when X, Y, Z? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then you said, Oh no, we actually can't do that. Even though it's fictional, we can't actually tell that story uh, because it's still classified. Or then you'd have to kill people. Or <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's um, a, a lot of that conversation actually happens when, um, like, every day when there's a shoot we would catch the dailies, right? So then they would send us the dailies in Washington, and I mean, they were shooting in New York at the time for the pilot. And then Hank would, would see what's called a brush pass, okay? So two people walking past each other, and then surreptitiously one transfers a folder or a document to the other, right? It's a classic, typical CIA or intelligence operation technique. Um, and he saw he said that, oh, that's not how you do it. <laughs> So, no, no, that's stupid. They shouldn't do it that way. They need to turn a corner and do this. I'm like, Hank, don't teach people how to do this better. <laughs> He's, so he said, okay, I get it. All right. So um, anyway, but for your first question, China, it's interesting because, yes, they, they are probably screening it much more tightly. But what's interesting is that back then in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot fewer movies, too. So um, I don't know. Maybe it's, uh, I, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but. You know, is it is it is it the party getting more involved, or is it something else? So. Thanks, Rodney. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Brian, and all of you for being here. This has been really fun. Um, I hope that you and enlightening, and I hope you have enjoyed the conversation. I do hope if you can stay a little bit for some refreshments and to talk with each other, that would be great. It's great to see you all in the Reeves room, and happy start to homecoming. Thank you.